Hello everybody and welcome to the BlueWorks Live December 2018 release preview session. I'm Margaret Thorpe, BlueWorks Live Offering Manager, and today I'm going to be giving you an overview of the BlueWorks Live release that's coming out this weekend on Saturday, December 8th. So this release of BlueWorks Live provides increased control over the layout of process diagrams, enhances the BlueWorks Live glossary, and introduces flexibility into the configuration of user authentication for a BlueWorks Live account. So you've got much more control over the layout of process diagrams now with a new marquee select tool that's available for multi-selection of process diagram elements, the new pin feature that allows the layout of process diagrams to be preserved, and the ability to reposition entry and exit points of flow lines on activities, gateways, and events in process diagrams. The glossary has been greatly improved, so glossary values can now be deleted from the glossary. Glossary values can have associated references, which can be file attachments, hyperlinks, or other glossary values. System and custom textual glossary properties can now be restricted to a predefined set of values, and a new API is available for updating glossary values. We've also added more flexibility around authentication. A BlueWorks Live account can be configured by the account admin to allow multiple authentication methods, BlueWorks Live, SSO, and IBM ID, all at the same time. And we have a couple of miscellaneous updates to mention. Um, BlueWorks Live generates .xlxx files for all of the uh, Excel exports now, and the low security policy has been removed. So let's take a closer look at these enhancements. First, let's look at some of the things that we've done to give you more control over the layout of your BlueWorks Live diagrams. Now, as you know, the BlueWorks Live product philosophy is to keep users focused on the content of their processes rather than on laying out the diagram. That's why BlueWorks Live automatically lays out the diagram for you. The downside of this is that it gives the user limited control over the appearance of their diagrams, which can sometimes be frustrating when the default BlueWorks Live auto layout algorithms make suboptimal choices or don't share the user's layout preferences. So we've introduced a number of features um, over the years that give the user more control over the layout. Uh, for example, relaxed layout, which lets you drag an activity below or above the previous activity. Um, align parallel flows feature, which lets you realign the outgoing paths from a parallel gateway. The flexible label placement feature, which lets you move the line labels on your diagram to make them easier to read. But users still have very little control over the placement of connecting lines, which keeps them from being able to make small changes to improve the readability of their diagrams. And sometimes the user may tweak their diagram to look just right, and then they make a change that causes BlueWorks Live Auto Layout to undo the effort that they put into tweaking the diagram. So for these reasons, we've introduced flexible docking points and the pin feature. So let's take a look at how these work. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first off, there's a new marquee select tool to make it easier to select multiple diagram elements. You can still use the keyboard controls to multi-select, but now you can use this tool when you need to quickly multi-select elements in a rectangular area. You'll find the tool above the upper left corner of your process diagram, as you can see here on my screen. You can select the tool, draw a rectangle, and all of the diagram elements within the rectangle will be selected. So you can proceed to color them, copy them, move them, turn them into subprocesses, and now you can pin them. So let's talk about pin. By pinning a section of the diagram, you can preserve the layout of elements in that section of the diagram. So pinning will cause BlueWorks Live to exclude that section from automatic layout changes whenever possible. So the way it works is once you've selected the elements that you want to pin, you can see the elements that I've selected here on the upper left side of the page. These four activities, gateway and end event, are highlighted with a gray outline indicating that they've been selected. If I right click on the selection, I see a new pin menu option. If I choose to pin my selection, then those elements will be highlighted with an orange shadow, as you can see on the right hand side of the slide. Now when the diagram is updated, those pinned elements won't be rearranged. Other users editing the diagram will see the orange highlighting. Um, but for anybody just viewing the diagram, those highlights will not be visible. <clears throat> now, if at any point I want to return control of the layout of the pin section to BlueWorks Live, I can simply unpin any or all of the pinned elements 
by selecting them and choosing the unpin menu option. Now there are a couple things to be aware of when using the pin feature. If you convert a selection that contains pin elements into a subprocess, that will cause them to unpin and revert to their default layout position. So be aware of that. And the, re the reset layout function, which is available on the background menu and, and causes the diagram to revert to the default layout, that reset layout function will not have any impact on pinned elements. Now let's take a look at how you can reposition where the flow lines enter and exit activities, gateways and events in your process diagrams. So up until now you had to live with the default positioning of, of these flow lines. But now you can choose where to dock the lines. So here's an example. In the upper left hand side of the slide is a diagram that I want to make more readable by changing where the flow lines come in and out of the set employee status to active activity and the orientation location gateway. Basically, I want my diagram to look like the one in the after picture on the upper right side of my slide. So to do that, step one, I select the line that I want to reposition, as I've done here on the lower left. You can see it becomes highlighted and shows a green node where it connects with the activity in the gateway. So in step two, I drag that green connector to a new docking port on the activity, which are the gray circles that you can see in this lower middle screenshot. And in step three, I drag the green docking port on the gateway to the docking port on the other corner. Now I can do the same thing with the line that's coming out of the gateway, and I end up with the diagram on the upper right, which I think looks better and is easier to follow than the original diagram. So this is a great way to make you know these kinds of small changes that add up to and produce more readable diagrams. So those are the diagram layouts enhancements that we have today. Now let's take a look at the glossary improvements. Many of you have asked for the ability to lock down glossary values. So now you can restrict input of glossary values to a set of predefined terms using the new enumerations feature for the system property and for custom text properties. Basically, the way it works is, first you need to turn enumerations on on the properties page of the admin console, which you can see here at the top. Um, there's a new column out to the right where you can enable and disable enumerations on that, on that page. Now, once you've set enumerations, set your, turned your enumerations on, on the uh, properties page on the admin console, then um, the only way to add new values is for glossary managers to add them directly in the glossary, as you see here in the screenshot on the lower left. And so now when editors are entering details for those properties, they will only be able to choose from the list of predefined values. They won't be able to enter their own. And you can see here in the screenshot on the lower left that the editors provided with a drop-down list of values to choose from. Um, they can filter these values, but they can only select from the list. They can't enter their own values anymore. Now, a couple of things that are worth mentioning about enumerations. At this time, you can only enable enumerations on the system property and on custom text properties. So that's something to keep, um, to keep in mind. And if you start using this feature, you know, if you find that it would be useful on some other properties, please let us know. Um, but the system property is by far the most requested um, property that folks have, have asked to have this on. Um, so it would be too limiting to enable enumerations for many glossary properties, you know, because your editors would be out of luck if the values that they needed had not been defined for a property, so they'd kind of be stuck. So in those cases, it makes more sense to continue to use preferred values, but when you truly have the need to enforce data entry, you can now do it for some of your properties using enumerations. So let's take a look at glossary references now. Um, so you can now capture references to both internal and external resources along with your glossary values. These glossary references can be either hyperlinks, attachments, or links to other glossary values. And as you can see here on the screenshot, there's a new column in the glossary titled References. If a glossary value already has references associated with it, you'll see the View References icon in that column. If you click on it, you'll bring up the references. If a glossary value does not have any references associated with it, when you, when you hover over the glossary value, the uh, Add Reference icon will appear, and you'll be able to add references to the glossary value. 
So you can see in this example here that I'm adding a reference hyperlink called State Vehicle Database to this input called Insurance Application. So glossary managers can add and view re references directly from the glossary, but what about editors? Well, editors with glossary access can add references in a few different ways. I mean, they, they, they have to add them from the glossary view, but they can get to the glossary view in a few different ways. So first off, if you're working in the documentation view, as I am in the screenshot on the upper left here, you can simply click on the glossary value and you'll be taken to the glossary entry, as you see on the screenshot at the bottom. And there you can click on the Add References icon and add references. If you're viewing a process diagram, as, as I am in the, the screenshot in the upper middle, <coughs> excuse me, you can click on the glossary value in the view pane. Once again, it'll take me into the glossary view and I can go ahead and add add reference, my, add my references. Um, and if you're editing the details of a process diagram or, or discovery map, as I am in the screenshot on the upper right, you, I can simply click on the edit pencil out to the right of the glossary value and I'll be taken to the glossary entry um, where you'll find where you can add references. So that's how editors add references. Now if you're viewing the documentation, so in terms of viewing references, if you're viewing documentation in the, uh, the upper left, for example, or up the process diagram here on the upper right, you can simply hover over the glossary value and any references associated with that glossary value will be displayed along with the description as you can see in that black box that pops up there. So you can click on the glossary reference link within that text box and it will actually navigate to the reference if it's a hyperlink or open up the file if it's a file attachment. Now I'd like to mention a couple of differences with respect to how this works for viewers versus editors. First off, even though glossary values aren't displayed in blue text for viewers, they can still hover over them to see descriptions and references. Um, but if a glossary reference is a link to another glossary value, viewers won't be able to navigate to the glossary link as they do not have glossary access. Only glossary participants can navigate to link glossary values. So editors and contributors will be able to do this if your account is configured for them to be glossary participants. Now I'd like to show you an example of how you might use the new glossary link references because this is something quite new. With file attachments and hyperlinks, I think it's um, pretty obvious how you might leverage references. But glossary links are a little different as they allow you to associate glossary values with other glossary values. So in this example, I'm going to use glossary reference links to associate three different custom properties, risks, controls, and evidence. So you can see here that I've just got one risk identified lack of operational resilience. And that risk is associated with two controls, BCR01 and BCR02. Each of those controls is associated with an item of evidence. In this case, the evidence for control BCR01 is a business continuity plan, whereas the evidence for control BCR02 is a business continuity test plan. So let's see how I would represent these risks, controls, and evidence in BlueWorks Live. First, I would add them as custom properties via the properties page of the admin console. Next, I would go to the glossary and define these risks, controls, and evidence. And once I've done this, I can associate them with each other. Here you can see that I've opened up the BCR02 control in the glossary, and I'm, going to, I'm about to associate it with its corresponding evidence by adding a glossary value reference link. Once I've clicked link glossary value, I'm presented with a picker to choose which property in BlueWorks Live I want to associate BCR02 with. I select evidence in this case, and I'm presented with the list of the evidence items to choose from. And you can see on the right that I'm choosing business continuity test plan as the evidence that I want to associate BCR02 with. Now, once I've added all of these and associated them with each other, here's what I see in the glossary. I've got a risk, two controls, and two pieces of evidence all of which have references associated with them, as you can see by looking out at the references column. So now let's just think for a moment how you might make use of this kind of thing, um, what this feature might enable you to do. Well, now, for example, users in, in our organization can go and look at the Manage Business Resiliency and Risk process 
And they can see all of the related risks, controls, and evidence right there within the context of the business process. So here, for example, I'm looking at the perform continuous business operations planning activity within the manage business resiliency and risk process. I can see the risk associated with that, this activity, lack of operational resilience, and I can see that there are two controls associated with it, BCR01 and BCR02, and I can bring up the description of BCR02 right there simply by clicking on it. As I continue to review the documentation of this business process and I move to the test continuous business operations activity, I can actually bring up the evidence showing that we've mitigated the risk associated with that, this activity. I can open up the business continuity test plan document just by clicking on the reference attachment. So that should give you an idea of, of the power of using glossary references. Now, of course, as you would expect, the glossary export includes glossary references as well. Um, and you can also import glossary references by including them in your CSV file when you import glossary values. And references are also returned by the Get Glossary Values API. And if you use glossary reference file attachments, you can manage them from the file management tab of the admin console, just like any other sort of Blueworks Cloud file attachment. In the screenshot above, you can see that Auto Personal App Word document, excuse me, Auto Personal App Word document is actually attached to the Glossary Value Insurance application. You can see that by hovering over it. If I click on it, I'm taken to the Insurance application entry in the Glossary, as you can see on the screenshot at the bottom. And I can easily go back to the File Management tab by clicking on the link at the top of the Glossary page, circled in green here, which should make it easier to go back and forth cleaning up file attachments um, whenever you do that, um, that fun administrative task. Speaking of fun administrative tasks, admins and glossary managers can now clean up unwanted glossary values using the new delete feature. So you just click on the delete icon next to the value that you want to delete, and as long as it's not being used, you'll be able to delete it. If it's being used, you'll get a message telling you so, like the one on the right here, which says, um, review the artifacts that are, or you can click on the text that says, review the artifacts that are using this glossary value, and it will show you where the glossary value is being used. And it's important to note that deleted glossary values are permanently removed and they can't be recovered. So make sure you really want to delete them before you do so. Now there's also a new inactive glossary view that's only accessible to admins. You can see here on the upper right that there's both an active and an inactive view and that you can toggle between them. And this, this view, this inactive view, will allow you to see glossary values that were defined using the visibility setting only visible when used, but that are not being used in active processes or published snapshots. So they're essentially invisible. And in BlueWorks Live today, you can't see those. Um, um, but with this new inactive page of the glossary, admins can see these. So, um, uh, so now that you can see them, you can clean them up. So in this example, I'm trying to delete an inactive participant called Chief Compliance Officer. Um, BlueWorks Live is telling me that this value is being used by an inactive blueprint, either an archive blueprint or a historical snapshot. <clears throat> it says that I can go ahead and delete the value but that if somebody restores the blueprint or the snapshot that uses this value, it will reappear in the glossary. So be aware in cases like this, you may delete something only to have it reappear at some future time. So if that happens, now you'll know why. So in general, it's really best to have admin privileges if you need to do a serious cleanup of your glossary, as opposed to just glossary manager privileges. This is because glossary manager privileges will only let you see glossary values used in artifacts that you have access to. So those that are in the spaces that you've been granted permission to. Um, and you won't be able to see these inactive glossary values at all unless you're an admin. Now, in order for admins to have access to this inactive glossary page, your account must be configured for admins to have full permissions on your account. So that's the first of the library customization options on the account customization tab of the admin console. 
um, that I've circled in green here. So um, make sure you look at that if you're, if you're going to be doing any serious cleanup of your account. So that's all I'm going to say about the glossary delete feature. We also have a new glossary update API. So today you can use the API to retrieve glossary values, to retrieve them only. Now with this release, you can also update glossary values via the put glossary values API. In order to use this API, you need glossary manager privileges. And to ensure that the performance of your account isn't negatively impacted, the API is rate limited to 30 requests per hour. Now that doesn't mean that you can't update more than 30 glossary values per hour though, as the API can be called in batch mode to perform bulk creation and update of glossary values. So if you'd like to learn more about this API, check out the API documentation on the Knowledge Center. Um, you'll find it under the artifact authoring category when you look at the, uh, the doc on the Knowledge Center. And in the example section of the doc there, you'll find a sample Java program that shows how to use the API with rate limiting. So um, have fun with that. And now let's take a look at how you can allow users in your account to log in using a variety of authentication methods. By default, BlueWorks Live authenticates users using basic authentication, which is based on a user ID and password. The admin can also configure BlueWorks Live to allow users to sign in using IBM registration ID, IBM ID, or single sign-on, SSO. Now admins can enable more than one method for their account at a time, thus allowing some users to log in using IBM ID, others to log in via basic auth, for example, and even others to log in using SSO. This is done by enabling the authentication methods that you want to allow for your account on the account security page of the admin console, as you can see here on the screenshot. I've enabled all three methods for this account. Now the way it will work is users will have to log in via SSO. So in this case, um, if their email domain matches one of the domains specified on the single sign-on tab, they will have to log in using IBM ID if their email domain matches one of the domains specified on the IBM ID tab. Otherwise, if their email domain doesn't match any of these, they'll be logged in using basic auth. So that's kind of the rules that I've created um, in this example. But the admin can go a step further um, and either allow users to choose their own authentication method by unchecking this um, restrict authentication method for all users checkbox up there, um, or they can even override the account default for individual users. So they have, you have a lot more control now. So if you uncheck that restrict authentication method for all users checkbox that we just saw, um, users will be able to choose their authentication method from the methods that are allowed for the account. So at invitation time, they'll see the dialog on the left here where they'll, where they'll be able to choose the authentication method. In this example, all three authentication methods are enabled for the account. At any time, they can go to their My User Settings, shown on the right here, and change their authentication method from the Security tab. The admin can also force a specific user to use a particular authentication method. So this is done by going to the user management tab and updating that user's user settings. In this example, I'm choosing not to impose any particular restriction uh, um, and so on this user, so the account defaults would apply. And in this case, you can see the message saying that the user's email domain matches one of the domains specified on the single sign-on tab. So this user would actually be logged in using SSO. But I could change that here if I wanted to, and I could force this user to use basic auth instead, for example. So that, this could be helpful, helpful if you think about it, um, like if your account is using SSO, but there's a user in your account writing programs using the BlueWorks Live APIs um, that needs to be using basic auth, you can you know, specifically um, uh, set that up so that particular user uses um, basic auth to log in. So that's how you can use multiple authentication methods for your BlueWorks Live account. And I just wanted to mention a couple of other things. So as we've warned you a couple times over the last few months, we've removed the low security policy. So if you still haven't upgraded your account security policy to at least a medium, please do so by end of day Friday. Otherwise, 
you know, if you're using basic auth, BlueWorks Live uh, user ID password, your users will likely have to change their passwords on Monday morning when they log in because your account security policy will be automatically upgraded to high. And you'll also find that the Excel file format has been upgraded. Um, so you'll get .xslx files rather than .xls files now. And um, so that's everything that I wanted to share with you today. And let me just summarize it really quickly because that's kind of a lot and some of it's a little bit complicated, I think. Um, but so you saw several new tools today that give you increased control over the layout of your process diagrams. This new marquee select tool that's available for multi-selection of process diagram elements. The new pin feature that allows the layout of process diagrams to be preserved. And the entry and exit points of flow lines can now be repositioned by the editor on activities, gateways, and events and process diagrams. You saw several glossary improvements. The glossary values can now be deleted from the glossary. Glossary values can have associated references and they can be file attachments, hyperlinks, or other glossary values. System and custom textual glossary properties can now be restricted to a predefined set of values and a new API is available for updating glossary values. You've seen how there's more flexibility now around what authentication method your account uses. Um, and a BlueWorks Live account can be configured by the account admin to allow multiple authentication methods now. So BlueWorks Live, SSO, and IBM ID um, in a variety of different combinations. And so you've got .xlsx files now for all your Excel exports and the low account security policy is gone. So that's everything I have for today. Um, I wanna thank you so much for joining and I'm gonna go ahead and open up the line to see if we've got any questions from you on, on any of these enhancements. Give me just a moment.